Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Uguchi Cynthia Abazi Abang, a class 2020 Rotary Peace Fellow at uh, who finished from Uppsala University in Sweden. And today I'm here to discuss about my thesis topic that specifically looked at uh, inclusive peace negotiations. And uh, prior to this, this has been a very uh, interesting topic because it has been something that has been debatable a number of times by the United Nations Security Council resolution on how to increase uh, women's representation in formal peace negotiations. And uh, I basically looked at how to foster that and ensure uh, that women have not only uh, numeric representation, but also value in terms of peace processes. I will be sharing a brief presentation that uh, provides first of all an overview uh, why I chose the topic. Number two, also looking at um, my experiences uh, during my research and uh, what my findings were, my methodology, and lastly, conclusions and some recommendations. Uh, that I felt it was critical for stakeholders um, and people working in this field to take cognizance of. So like I mentioned, uh, the topic is basically uh, women's civil resistance and securing inclusion in elitist or formal peace negotiations. In terms of giving a brief background, uh, initially, uh, while I was studying in Uppsala University in 2002, uh, before I began writing my thesis in January 2003, uh, I was able to go for my uh, field, the academic field experience uh, in Ghana. And uh, in the northern part of Ghana, called Tamale, I was introduced to a number of uh, peace building forums because there were low density conflicts in the area. And part of the remarkable discoveries that I found was that in a number of these platforms, mostly males were dominant. There were very few women that were included in these processes, despite the fact that women play a very critical role, not only in peace building, but also in conflict prevention. This is a picture of the traditional Peace Council at uh, Tamale. If you can see from the picture, there are only three women out of the whole council chiefs. And uh, part of the things I also discovered was that many of these women were given very minor administrative roles. So in terms of the peace deliberations or critical uh, things to discuss about uh, regarding peace agreements, they were mostly, women were mostly excluded from these platforms. And the rationale was that peace uh, conversations or deliberations were considered mostly a male dominated affair because there was this aspect of militarization and conflict perceived from the ambit of uh, male dominated theories. So women were not really having a voice despite the fact that decisions that would affect them. We are going to be discussed in these forums and decided without their inputs. And then I began to think, if women play a role and there is actually a global uh, mandate to sort of ensure the visibility of women in peace processes and also enable peace structures take cognizance of their voices to ensure that whatever peace structures that are designed, designed post-conflict, uh, integrate gender-sensitive institutions and ensure that also women are represented and uh, their voices are heard uh, within these processes. Um, but the challenge is that there is a gap between how this should happen in terms of global aspirations to global practice. So what we have currently is that, for instance, we have the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 that enjoys all state parties to ensure that whenever there are peace 
uh, negotiations going on or peace building forums, women are integrated there uh, so that uh, gender sensitive structures can be reflected in post-conflict societies. But there is no effective mechanism to foster that, um, foster the achievement of that. So what you have is on paper, this is uh, mostly reflected in a number of countries that have signed you know, the UN Council resolution, even so many organizations and state parties have uh, work plans regarding that. But how this effectively translates in practice is a huge gap. And so that was what began making me think through these thesis topics, thesis topic about how can I ensure that I bridge this gap in my research? What are some of the tools that can be very, very relevant for women groups who desire to be part of the peace processes happening within their areas? How can they ensure that they break these barriers of exclusion and arrive at the table of the deliberation process together with their male counterparts? And it's just recognizing that each party has a role to play and looking at peace process from a holistic perspective so that we don't have deficient peace agreements that do not take into consideration the impact of conflict on women, of women on the ground, and then also ensure that gender sensitive institutions are integrated in the construction of the post-conflict societies. Uh, but then a number of people also will ask, why is it even important to include women in peace structures in the first place? So research has consistently uh, attested to the fact that one, that uh, gender, is that war is actually gendered uh, in the sense that uh, there are differential impacts of conflict on both males and females. And this thesis topic, like I mentioned, is not really to highlight more about women, but to show that uh, despite the fact that research has attested to the fact that yes, that there are disparities uh, within conflict societies, uh, the same effects of conflict on men is not going to be the same as women. So that is the reason why whenever we are thinking of putting together peace councils or coming up with peace resolution documents, we need to integrate this realistic perspective into such processes to ensure that we address the differential impacts of conflict. Secondly, peace processes usually occur behind closed doors, like I mentioned, without women's participation in most these, because militarization uh, is perceived as a predominantly male-dominated area. But also, there are women who are combatants as well. So uh, how do we also highlight that, you know, even and reflect that uh, even in peace processes? So it's good to take this into perspective as well. Research has also consistently uh, noted that building sustainable and durable peace structures require a recognition of the operational gender dynamics within conflict context. For instance, we've had situations, uh, especially in the Rwandan genocide, uh, where a lot of women became automatically heads of households because their partners or their husbands uh, we are going out to fight wars. And so they had to be more like both the breadwinners and nurturers within their, uh, their, their immediate environment and their uh, homes and context. Not only that, uh, because of the rates of sexual violence within conflicts, a number of women organizations began to uh, provide trauma counseling for victims and a number of interventions, including uh, providing aftercare you know, for some of the victims that have been impacted uh, by some of the conflict situations happening within their context. Uh, research has also attested to the fact that including women in peace processes fosters the legitimacy for the process. And it also addresses the gender disparities, like I mentioned, and inequitable structures uh, that are existent within post-conflict societies. It also enhances the propensity for the durability of the peace accord. There is this momentum that stems from women being involved in processes. There's this kind of legitimacy it builds and a number of uh, 
people recognize women's contributions, even both at the local or at the regional or at the central level. Uh, and it, there is this uh, aspect that anything attracting going by women attracts some measure of sympathy uh, and then also foster some measure of legitimacy. So uh, ensuring that uh, women are integrated in this process sort of builds that uh, acceptability for the process. Uh, and it is a good way to structure most peace processes by giving women a seat at the table. But like I mentioned, uh, despite the plethora of um, research attesting you know, to women's contribution in peace processes, the gap now is that in practice, the reality is not the case. Well, obviously some countries in the global north uh, have gone ahead in terms of the gender disparity gap by uh, bridging that gap. But the reality is not the case uh, in most countries in the global south. And this um, research was mainly focused at the global south level uh, because there are a number of active women organizations that are doing a lot, but even during conflicts, uh, they've been raising their voices to for belligerents to stop conflict situations within their terrain. But yet what you have consistently happen is that whenever peace discussion starts, these women are not recognized or integrated. And yet decisions impacting these women will be reached in their absence. So uh, based on this existing research gap and focus, one is that scholars, scholarly literature have attested to the gains of women uh, in peace building, yet there is a gap explaining how women can actually foster inclusion in peace negotiation processes. There is also a lot of focus that centers on women's victimhood as opposed to women's agency as potential contributors to peace. So a number of uh, articles or rhetorics mostly focus on women as victims of gender-based violence, uh, victims also uh, in conflict situations, uh, looking at the health dynamics and how it impacts them without actually uh, attesting to their strength and collective unity, how they have mobilized, organized, and even put themselves in the front line to support other women and not only men, support families and raise their voices uh, to ensure an end to the conflict happening within their own context. There is also the uh, theory on the potency of civil resistance. Now, when I began to look at uh, these gaps, uh, one way I felt that um, women actually could get to the table was um, if they could collectively mobilize and push as a group uh, to break that existing barrier of exclusion. And when I began to search more and uh, study more on this, I came across the theory of civil resistance. Civil resistance uh, entails or discusses more about nonviolent methods in propelling peace. Uh, it has been notable among several scholars uh, like Nielsen, uh, like Swenskren, like uh, Chenoweth and Cunningham. They've written a number of articles attesting to the potency of civil resistance and nonviolent me um, methods uh, that could include, you know, either uh, trying to build, uh, for use negotiation platforms or strikes or basically um, uh, marches, demonstrations, uh, but anything that does not involve violence just to gain attraction to the movement and attract some measure of leverage that could be utilized to push uh, relevant parties to consider their agenda and also their objective of wanting be, to be part of the peace process within their communities. And so my research question basically focused on the facts I wanted to look at does women's civil resistance really foster include, increased chances of them gaining access to the peace negotiations? So while scholars have already, like I mentioned from the pre previous slide, attested to the potency of civil resistance and mobilization of groups, uh, but I noticed that in some contexts, 
some women groups utilized these methods and they were able to gain some measure of traction that enabled them gain access to the peace negotiation table. In some other contexts, it wasn't the case. So why, what was it, what was the difference? Why were there different outcomes? What is it about the dynamics that uh, fostered different outcomes within different contexts? Uh, so my research question was more specific, specifically uh, about addressing those, the question, does women's civil resistance foster increased chances of inclusion in peace negotiations. And I adopted more like a qualitative approach uh, methodology using the case studies of Colombia, of Liberia, and Mozambique. The interesting thing about these cases was that they were different outcomes. So in Colombia, uh, the women's movement was able to gain access to the peace negotiation table. And not only that, even decide on certain peace uh, clauses that were contained in the agreement uh, and making for a robust uh, peace agreement. Uh, the same happened in Liberia, but in Mozambique, despite uh, their mobilization, uh, they had a different outcome. They were not able to get access to the peace negotiation table and the peace um uh, process was decided without any women representation from any women's groups. So, uh, like I mentioned, there were different reasons uh, why I chose these three countries. Number one was the variation in the dependent variable, and that is whether or not they were able to access, get gain access to the peace negotiation table. Uh, so, like I mentioned, why were women included in the talks in Colombia and Liberia, but not in Mozambique? And then I discovered that there were indeed connections with the nature of the women's civil resistance. How did they mobilize? How did they come together? What was the nature of their uh, civil resistance that they undertook? And how did that pave the way for either securing inclusion or not securing inclusion uh, in the peace negotiation table? And some of my preliminary findings were as follows that number one, that there are indeed connections between women's civil resistance and these women groups securing inclusion when these women groups are cohesive. So in other words, when they have effectively mobilized and organized, they have a collective objective, which is to make sure that they get represented uh, at the peace negotiation table to lend their voice to the peace process uh, there are mechanisms within their own groups for addressing internal dissensions because obviously we groups have different interests and there might be tensions here and there because of the different ideologies. It's very erroneous to admit that women groups uh, have just one thinking because they are all women. There are obviously different dynamics associated with that. But we, uh, when there are mechanisms that are included for addressing uh, any sort of conflict, that way it prevents anything from escalating. And with part of the things that I also discovered was that when they sustained engagement over time, this is not like a one year uh, maybe movement and then it dissipates, no. But when women have been consistent and keep pushing for recognition, uh, in terms of building this agenda and wanting to gain access. Because peace negotiations span a very long time. Some span like five years, some span like 10 years, so it depends. But when women have been very consistent in the agenda, uh, calling for inclusion, uh, that has been able to uh, break the barriers and ensure that they are accepted uh, within the peace negotiation process. Part of the things also discovered was that where there was external support, from international actors like the UN Women Organizations, peace organizations, regional women's networks and donor organizations that have sort of created that international pressure to include women groups uh, in uh, the peace discussions. It has made uh, the, the conflicting parties rethink uh, the process about closing the doors. So uh, this, in, I, in addition to women's mobilization and organization, has sort of created the necessary pressure 
to open up the peace negotiation process. And then also where there is an enabling political climate in terms of recognition of democratic structures, uh, and then women as equal counterparts in the development of peace, where there are also local legislations legitimizing freedom of you know, public assembly and press. Women have used these tools as a, an enabling way to foster the agenda for inclusion. So in conclusion, uh, part of my recommendations has always been that there's a need to make peace negotiations and structures more inclusive. So we need, in as much as, yes, a number of uh, studies have mentioned uh, the importance of women uh, in peace structures. There is also a need for this to be practicalized and ensure that it translates effectively in what is happening uh, in, in, in the contextual uh, dynamics of, of certain countries, especially post-conflict societies that do not see this as very important uh, in peace processes. So we need to open up peace processes and ensure that we make peace negotiations and structures more inclusive. Women's agency in peace building is very critical as opposed to viewing women as a victims in armed conflict. Uh, the way women are conceived also goes a long way to uh, painting the picture of uh, the acceptability you know, of the agenda or not. And uh, more emphasis should be on women's agency uh, in peace building and their roles uh, as critical peace actors within certain conflicts, I mean, conflict contexts. There's also the need for using nonviolent means. A lot of the switch in this day and age has uh, been tilting towards violence. And uh, as much as possible, this doesn't uh, lead to good outcomes within countries and societies. But there's also Nonviolent means of uh, addressing situations have been very useful, especially for women groups as a tool for the advocacy, as opposed to resorting to violence because of exclusion. Uh, and so in this study, I was able to establish that connection, especially in terms of women's group, about how useful uh, nonviolent potency is in terms of forging an agenda and then also ensuring that uh, the, there's this leverage that comes for persistent advocacy to recognizing that women groups have an integral role to play as contributors to peace. And I ended also by noting that there should be more research uh, regarding women's civil resistance, because in all the contexts that I considered, none was an authoritative context or regime. Uh, so that was actually a scope condition for my study. Uh, I emphasize the need to ensure that uh, there would be more consideration and more research, um, uh, research actually in finding the connections between uh, women's civil resistance uh, in securing inclusion in peace negotiations where uh, the terrain is not of a democratic nature, but also an authoritarian regime. It will be an interesting find uh, that way we can have a balanced perspective uh, about uh, if what obtains in democratic societies is also reflective uh, in authoritarian, authoritarian regimes. And uh, I wanted to also mention a very key uh, video this was from Liberia. Uh, it was one of the success stories. Uh, and uh, I felt that it's very critical to include this uh, in the presentation for women to see how civil resistance actually changed the narrative uh, in Liberia. Finally, 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 we are in the limelight. When men failed to end 14 years of civil war in Liberia, Lema Bowie rallied the women of her nation to stop it. Why do you think you were able to accomplish what politicians and generals and warlords were not? We succeeded because 
And this is the lesson for the rest of the world. There is nowhere in this world where someone give you a slap and you slap them back and expect that it's settled. Violence have never settled peace. I tell people I was 17 when the war started. The first time I saw a dead body, I freaked out. By 31, I could cross over a dead body without thinking twice. That's not a normal life. Her activism is the focus of a critically acclaimed documentary, Pray the Devil, Back to Hell. She began with counseling child soldiers who fought in Liberia's civil war. Later, she led a campaign against rape, uniting Muslim and Christian women in sit-ins and daily marches. The pains of a Muslim woman was no different from the pains of a Christian woman. When that message finally sunk, there was no turning back. They dressed in white to symbolize peace. Why did you think this strategy would work? We didn't think about success. We were just determined to be out there for as long as it took. If your society is upside down, you turn it up right. And soon developed a strategy to wage sex strikes to get their husbands on board. We felt they were too quiet and they were allowing these evil men to walk all over them. She's now working to spread her message of empowerment to women in other nations torn by war. Michelle Miller, CBS News, New York. Thank you so much uh, for listening in. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. If you have any feedback regarding the presentation, please contact me by email at CynthiaAbazi at Yahoo.com. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.